time comes from Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verses 11 through 14. 14. <clears throat> of whom have we many things to say, and hard to be under utter, seeing ye are dull of hearing? For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which is the first principle of the oracles of God, and are to come touching them, need of milk, and not of strong meat. Unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. For strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, Patrick will bring us the lesson. Now, Patrick, please. righteous judgments towards ourselves, towards others, and especially towards God and His Word. Um, see the third one being misused a lot by the world and the religious world a lot, but we can fall into this category as well, and so I think we need to look at this. Um, the goal this morning is that I hope we might all be able to to reach a level of spiritual maturity, we're different levels. Some of us in here that are very mature spiritually, I would think, that know quite a bit more about the Bible in different areas than some of us. Um, YC probably knows more about the Old Testament than any of us, I would think, way more than I do. Uh, <coughs> I haven't studied as much of the, the Old Testament as I should. Um, and so varying levels, and we all have areas that we can improve in, um, but we need to increase our level of maturity spiritually so that our senses can be exercised to discern good and evil, and like our scripture reading said, that we need to make us skillful in the word of righteousness. So I read a book, well, I listened to a book, um, I don't read too much more. I listen to audiobooks. But I read one called Positive Intelligence, and like I said, this isn't about being smart. Um, but uh, he was, he's a writer from India, and he was talking about the judge in all of us. And he was talking about weakening the judge and the nine saboteurs that go along with the judge to strengthen, strengthen the sage or the wise person in all of us. And the way that I have this categorized um, is based on um, the test that I took um, on his website. And this was in order of how my nine saboteurs are based on his testing. Um, so hyper-rational is one, one controller, avoider, hyper-vigilant, hyper-achiever, victim, and pleaser. And so, mine being at the top, I would be hyper-rational compared to any of the others. But somebody else might be something different. But the way that the writer words this is the judge would be 
stronger than any of these. And so sometimes, a lot of times in our lives, we judge ourselves sometimes too harshly. We judge other people a little too harshly. Um, and as we'll look at as well, we probably judge God and his word a little too harshly. The writer didn't get into religion. He was more talking about um, businesses and teams and how they work together. But I was on this. And so he was, his way of weakening the judge and making us wiser was talking about paying attention to ourselves and how we use these characteristics in our everyday lives and to just simply label them. And if we're paying attention to ourselves and we think, oh, okay, I did something wrong and we start beating ourselves up, oh, that's the judge. And if we label that, we the judge in ourselves. Okay? So I don't normally read um, self-help books, but um, he's talking about being happier in our lives and letting, and he's not talking about not making judgments, but he's talking about let, letting love and wisdom rule our character instead of um, letting the judge rule us. Okay? So, that's all good, but the thing is, we don't need man to tell us how to live happier lives. Because the Bible's been telling us how to do this for over 2,000 years. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Um, if you would, turn to John chapter 7. And that's where we're going to start to introduce the topic for this morning. In John chapter 7, it's where we're going to begin. Just a little bit of a backdrop here. Secretly to a feast. And some of the people have already started talking about Jesus. And some of them spoke good of him. And some of them spoke evil of him. But no one wanted to speak openly about him. Because they were afraid of the Jews. Verse 14 of John chapter 7. And it says here, in beginning in verse 14, Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters having been written? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God, or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of, my, of himself... Seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet why go ye about to kill thee? The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil who goeth about to kill thee. Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because is it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision, that the law of Moses should be broken, are ye angry at me, because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Now Jesus is speaking of religious matters, and we're going to be religious matters in all of this, but we're also going to look at just judging ourselves in general and judging um, if we're going to have an overall religious theme to it as well. Um, so let's also Matthew chapter 7 because that's going to be our context for the first two points. And most of us know Matthew chapter 7. We know that a lot of people take this out of context. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. And a lot of people stop there. We know that. But he continues on. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye judge, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? 
Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. Now, there's a lot of talk as to what all of this passage means, um, but I would su subject to you that I think logically it's not talking about degrees of sin, one being bigger than another. Um, the Bible tells us that there's going to be one judgment day for all of us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. It doesn't matter what one sin is over another. God sees sin just all the same. We put levels of sin. We might see Hitler as one level of sin and a little lie as another level of sin, but God sees sin all the same. There's only going to be one hell. There's not going to be any levels of hell for different um, levels of sin. I said we classify levels of sin, but God sees sin as sin. Matthew chapter 25, verses 32 and 33. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And in verse 46 of that passage, he tell us, tells us what's going to happen to both of these. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, speaking of the goats but the righteous into life eternal. There's only going to be one punishment for those goats. There's not going to be different levels. So what this is talking about, though, is that we have to make ourselves right before God. Under the Old Testament law, the priests had to make atonement for their own sins before they could make atonement for the sins of the people. Under the new law, we're told that Christians are priests, with Christ being the high priest. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, or special people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. To become Christians when we obey the gospel, God had to show us mercy. He forgave us of our sins, and if we continue to walk in the light, when he forgave us of our sins, we're going to continue to receive mercy, and that's the only way we're going to get into heaven, because that's the grace of God. And what a lot of people do, what a lot of Christians do, is they continue to remember their sins and beat themselves up. And that's what this writer was talking about in the book, is that we remember the things that we do and we beat ourselves up on a regular basis. We judge ourselves continually. And as Christians, sometimes we continue to beat ourselves up. Paul could have done this. If you would, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul talks about his past sins here in 1 Timothy when he's writing to Timothy. Paul could have remembered everything that he did, and he could have let it hold him back in serving God. But in 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all ex acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Paul recognized that he was um, a chief among sinners, all the things that he had done, and he could have let that hold him back in serving Christ. But in verse 16, he says, How be it for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. 
Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit unto thee, son of Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Paul recognized that just because all of these past sins were in his life, that he had work to do for God, and he wasn't going to let these past sins slow him down. He was going to forgive himself because he knew that God forgave him, and God showed him mercy, so he was going to allow himself to show mercy on himself. And we, as Christians, need to follow after Paul and know that God has forgiven us. We can forgive ourselves. When we forgive ourselves, when we make ourselves right with God, according to Matthew chapter 7, that frees us up to make us available to forgive others. If you would, turn to Colossians chapter 3. That takes us to our next point. God has shown mercy to us. We should be able to show mercy to others. Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Paul again writing, he says, Put on therefore as the elect of God holy and beloved, vows of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, longsuffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And he's not just talking about Christians here. We need to be willing to show mercy to all mankind because he writes this, he writes that we're to show kindness to all, but the household of faith first, and the Ephesians letter. So verse 14, and above all these things, put on charity or love, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom get to the wisdom part later on, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Once God has forgiven us and we have forgiven ourselves, again, we are free to make way to be able to forgive others our lives. And somebody might ask, well, and he says here that we're to forgive as God forgave us. That means we've repented and God forgave us. And somebody might ask, well, what if somebody's not willing to repent? Well, he give, gives us that answer. In verse 14, he said, put on charity or love. If we have an attitude of love, then verse 8, he says to put off anger, wrath, malice, we're, allowed, we're to allow love to rule our hearts, not anger, wrath, or malice. And that means we're always ready to forgive when somebody is willing to repent. So whenever that may come, whenever they're willing to repent, we're always ready to forgive, no matter when that might happen. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8 of chapter 5 says, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God was willing to send his son to die for a lost people. Because he knew there would be some that would be willing. He was willing to show grace and give people an opportunity showed us that love and that kindness before we ever even obeyed him. And so we should have the ability to show mercy to others when they repent. Making righteous and wise judgments, like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 verse 24, also means that we don't judge based on appearance. This could be looks. It could be how we judge a situation on the surface without having all the facts. Acts chapter 10, verse 34 and verse 35 says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him 
and work as righteousness is accepted with him. So again, we should be like God and not be a respectful. James talks about this. If you would turn to James chapter 2. James puts this into practice for Christians. Gives us an example of how we should be like God and not being a respecter of persons and judging by appearance or judging based on situation because we don't know everything that's going on. James chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. He says, My, my brethren... Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons? For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and godly apparel, or goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts. Hearken, my brethren, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you, and draw you before the judgment seat? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye can convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, and also do not kill. Now if thou commit, do, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as though as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty, or freedom. For ye shall have judgment without mercy, that have showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. And finally, we need to have righteous, or be able to make righteous judgments. Toward God and His Word. This time, if you would turn to Second Timothy chapter two. Again, Paul is writing to the young preacher Timothy. A lot of us know this passage, beginning in verse fourteen. He says, "Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them." Before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred. Herod saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth of the, the, them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great noise, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but, the gentle, but be gentle unto all, apt to teach patience. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God, for adventure, will, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Now he's writing to a preacher here, but I think we should 
consider the fact that this isn't just a job or a duty for preachers, but possibly for all Christians that we might consider. That we should all avoid foolish questions, avoid gender strifes, avoid strife, but be gentle with all. Be patient and strive after the knowledge for truth. Avoid the snare of the devil. If we're handling a right, God's word, this means that we're using it for the right reasons. It means we're making proper judgments, or as we read in Hebrews chapter 5, we're able to discern good and evil. It's no longer milk as for babes, but we're using it for meat as mature Christians. We have the right attitude. In the Old Testament, we can read that prophets of old said, what the Lord saith, that will I speak. In the New Testament, in 1 Peter 4.11, we read, speak as the oracles of God, or as if God were saying it himself. God, Christ, and his word are all the standard by which man should fix their lives. Too many in the world today, or too many in the religious world today, try to change the Bible to fit what they already believe, instead of trying to fix their lives to what the Bible says. But... You know, we're not immune to this either. Just because we've obeyed the gospel doesn't mean that we can't attempt to interject our own opinions. We should also speak as the oracles of God. The old gospel preachers used to say, speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. And they may have come up with this. They're taking this from 1 Peter 4.11. And there's a lot of Bible truth in this. I'd like to read one more passage, and then I'll leave you with some words from Psalms and Proverbs, and we'll close. If you would turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we'll wrap this up. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is reminding, or these were Gentiles, so he's teaching them about the Israelites of old and telling them that there were some that had sinned through fornication and in that day, in verse 8, 23,000 fell that day due to committing fornication. In verse 12, he says, Him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my beloved, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless is not the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. If you skip down to verse 21. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and drink the cup of the devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? See, if we're making righteous judgments, if we're following after God's will, Three passages, and we'll close. Psalms 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Proverbs 2, and verse 6. For the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth, cometh knowledge and understanding. And Proverbs 3, and verse 13. Remember I said we didn't need man to tell us how to be happy. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom. And the man, or... And, yeah, and the man that getteth understanding. God's been telling us for millennia how to be happy. And it's following after his word and growing in the wisdom of his word. We all make judgments every day. The question is, what kind of judgments have we been making? Toward ourselves, toward others, and towards God and his word. This morning, are you a Christian that's fallen away? Do we need to make the right and wise judgment to make our soul right with God today? Are we a lost soul that needs to make that rise, right and wise judgment to obey the gospel, to 
repent of our sins, confess faith before men, and to wash away our sins in baptism, calling on the name of the Lord. Whatever your need is this morning, won't you come as we stand and as we sing.
righteous and just and spare it all offense that pleases unto you. We pray for this nation.